Hi, everybody. I'm Diane Brady. I'm here with Joe Nacera, journalist and author who, along with journalist Bethany McLean, has just published The Big Fail, what the pandemic revealed about who America protect, protects and who it leaves behind. Good to see you, Joe. Nice to see you, Diane. So I feel like a lot of people would say we're still living in a somewhat pandemic economy, post-pandemic economy. What I know that you're, the big fail sort of immediately says to me that there were lessons here to be had that uh, about what we didn't do right. What do you think was most surprising to you in the research that you did? Was that there really was zero science behind lockdowns, which were described, at least in blue states, as an example of following the science. But when you actually looked into it, there has never been a study um, pre-pandemic about the efficacy of lockdowns. And post-pandemic, uh, the e efficacy is very much in doubt. Yeah, in, in, in some ways, when I heard about the the test case they were using was the Spanish flu from essentially, you know, a century earlier, which may not be the best test case for what to do in the 21st century. When you say that was surprising, is it really when you're looking at the damage that lockdowns caused? Because I certainly think about it with regard to my children and schooling. Oh, without, without question. I mean, the worst, the worst outcome of lockdowns was the effect it had on, on children, especially disadvantaged children, uh, who were deprived of the ability to go to school. And it had ramifications from suicidal thoughts to lack of hot food um, that kids rely on to, you know, the basic of basics, which is, you know, what are you learning? So many kids just dropped out of school, just abandoned school. It's just, you can't overstate how bad it was. You know, you tackle so much in this book. You talk about, you know, the industrialization of hospitals, you talk about politics, policies. Um, let's focus on, on the politics for a second. You know, we see so much extremism now, and certainly a lot of people start with blaming Donald Trump. To what extent is it fair to see him as the villain in this scenario? Well, his... His ability to polarize, or the fact that he was such a polarizing figure, um, definitely definitely played a role. Uh, also, his um, you know sort of refusal at the beginning to acknowledge that this was real, um, and then his refusal you know once it really got going to do anything except sit on his sit on his rear. Now, the one good thing about that, really good thing, was that all the people who were involved in Operation Warp Speed, um, at least the ones who were not part of the administration, were, were Democrats. <laughs> they really didn't care about Trump or care for Trump, and their whole attitude was, we have to do this for the country, and if this guy will just leave us alone, we can get it done. And, so, and sure enough, he did leave them alone, and they did get it done. Um, uh, that's a good thing. But no, We should just, clarify just, those who don't recall Operation Warp Speed was the race basically to create a vaccine. That, that's right. And they did it in less than a year. And no vaccine previously had ever been done in less than four or five years. And, and even before that, it was more like a decade. So it, it's really it's a it's a remarkable accomplishment. Um, the, the, and, and in our book, we may be anti lockdown, but we're very pro vaccine because, you know, our goal was to be led by the data, real the real mm -hmm. data. And vaccines um, saved a lot of lives and prevented a lot of really bad cases of COVID. You know, one of the things that continues to be a question, this obviously goes into the Biden administration, is spending. The amount of, we, we, you know, this was a triumph of big government in some ways. We saw so much money being poured into supporting certain sectors of the economy. Is that part of the big fail to you or would that be part of... Uh, the success or a bit of both? Uh, it's a little bit of both, really. Um, I think it's frustrating to see that the airlines um, got so much money. Uh, you know, I think it was something on the order of $25 billion. Uh, and, and, and in return for that money, they were supposed to keep people on their payroll. And they did until the expiration date. So they got to keep the money and they laid everybody off the minute they could. 
Um, and, and, and airlines, you know, they had spent so much money buying back their stock and, and did they really deserve that kind of dough? And meanwhile, restaurants could get nothing. Uh, they were, their, their business model was such that it was very hard for them to get government funded, the government funded aid that other small businesses got. And, and, and restaurants are really the heart and soul of so many communities. Um, and yet they were really left to fend for themselves. And I, I, found that, I, I found that to be very frustrating. The other aspect of this, Diane, is, you know, the, the, the Zoom class of which you and uh, I would be part. Absolutely. And we could say safely in our homes and um, uh, enjoy our Zoom cocktails with our friends and order our Zoom meals with DoorDash and buy our whatever we needed from Amazon.com. And then there was a whole class of people labeled, quote unquote, essential, who were not given that option and who had to go to work. I mean, basically put their lives on the line so that we could live in comfort. And I found that to be deeply offensive. So when we're talking about lessons here, what do you want the takeaway of the book to be? I mean, one of the kind of fundamental lessons is really that, you know, capitalism as it's, as it's currently structured, you know, did not prepare us for this pandemic and arguably might not prepare us for the next one. I mean, in terms of where we are today, what do you think are, are, do you still see some of the legacy problems that will make us um, ill-suited for the next big crisis that comes along? I do. Let me, let me separate it into two, two buckets. Okay. Uh, the first one would be the capitalism bucket, the economy bucket. Um, government did, a, I think the government, I'm glad the government was willing to spend mu as much money as it was to, uh, to help people with extended unemployment and the, the aid it did give to small businesses. Um, I also, but I do think that one of the things it proved was that there are certain aspects of the economy that really shouldn't be basically for profit. I mean, when you hospitals. Have for profit hospitals that are, are, are trying to maximize shareholder value, you know, the only way you do that is to have more, more, uh, procedures, many of which might not be necessary, and to scrimp on certain kinds of patient care, which is one of the reasons the big hospitals mostly didn't accept the, 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 the kind of patient who was on Medicaid because they didn't mm -hmm. make them any money. Ditto private equity in nursing homes, which was a true disaster. Private equity owned a 10 or 15% of the nation's nursing homes, but more than that, they had an ethos that other private equity, excuse me, that other nursing homes followed, and that really was a disaster for the country and for the elderly. On the other side, on the, on the uh, mitigation side, on the public health side, I would say the biggest failure was the unwillingness to tell the truth to the American people. Uh, and I don't, you know, the unwillingness to say, for instance, those three words, we don't know. We don't know at the beginning whether this will harm children or not. We don't know the effect of certain things. We don't know if it makes sense to be six feet apart or three feet apart. And um, people, the, Sweden got a lot of criticism, obviously, because they had a no lockdown, a very little mitigation strategy, although yeah. they did protect the elderly. And one of my sources in the book pointed out that Sweden, when the time came for vaccines, when the vaccine became available in Sweden, 97% of the population got vaccinated. And the reason for that is because the population trusted their government, because the government had told them what the situation was, why they were doing what they were doing, how people could respond if they didn't, if they didn't, you know, want to be out in restaurants and so on and so forth. And they, so they, they, that trust is something that we really lost. And mm. even more important than whether we have lockdowns the next time or whether we wear masks the next time, the need for the government to, to tell us the truth is the most important thing. Well, the, the lack of trust was almost a pre-existing condition prior to the pandemic, was it not? I mean, we were already seeing this lack of trust in institutions, um, you know, across the board on both sides, you know, of the aisle, so to speak. I mean, it, did this sort of exacerbate the lack of trust well, or it, it was really reflected it in a yeah. way? 
I think it brought it into a different realm. Um, uh, public health, you know, public health by and large had people believed in public health. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, there was, uh, there was the uh, autism uh, vaccine, the anti-vaccine people who believed it created autism and, and things like that. I'm not, I don't want to minimize that, but um, when, when, when Anthony Fauci started saying, I am science, and if you don't believe in me, you don't believe in science. And, um, and when public health, you know, when it became, when they allowed it to become this blue state versus red state thing, you know, are you going to lock down or not lock down? If you don't lock down, then you're not following the science. It, it was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. And, and um, it didn't have to be that way. Um, and it was because the, the government officials in charge, especially at the beginning, were so uh, adamant about their righteousness that it really eroded a lot of trust, especially when it turned out in so many ways they were wrong. Let's take where we are today. I mean, let's start with the politics. We have a number of people who are currently now, you know, running for office. Ron DeSantis, you know, comes to mind as somebody who wants to be the GOP nominee. And, you know, Florida was kind of in some ways uh, a test case for uh, all that was good and bad uh, about this whole pandemic. What what do you make of sort of the current conversations around the lessons learned when you listen to the political discourse around this? Well, um, it's, it, 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 it's interesting. Um, you know, there's, I think there's widespread agreement on both the left and the right that closing schools was a disaster. And I don't think you'll see that happen again. Um, mm -hmm. One of the reasons that was instituted in the beginning was that during influ influenza kills children. And our previous pandemics had all been influenza based. So it made sense in the beginning, we don't know anything about this virus. What are we gonna do? Well, let's shut down the schools that, you know, but at a certain point, it didn't make sense anymore. And I think we all now realize what a mistake that was um, on the left and the right. Um, I, I think that um, in terms of DeSantis, you know, my view is that he handled the pandemic very well at the beginning. Uh, he was a little, I mean, Florida is a state where people can be outdoors a lot more than they can be in, in, in northern states, and that really mm -hmm. helped. Um, but, you know, he made a decision that he wasn't going to be only listening to public health officials. He was also going to listen to the to uh, business people and the economists in his state, and he was going to balance, he was going to balance how to manage COVID that, that, you know, I mean, think about this. COVID isn't the only people, only thing people died of between 2020 yep. and 2022. And we did a terrible job of protecting people with cancer, people who needed surgery, people who needed, you know, it's just like we, we, our maniacal focus on COVID at the expense of everything else, I think was a mistake. Whether we realize that now or not, I am not sure, but by and large, I do think that as a society, we're going to be a lot more cautious the next time around. And I would I would argue that if there is another wave of COVID, which there could very well be, there will be no lockdowns. And masks will be not mandatory, but you know, uh, you can decide you can decide for yourself. And I think nobody's going to close down a sports arena and nobody's going to tell basketball players they have to or have, have to get vaccinated to get on the court. I, none of those things are going to happen. We have learned we have learned a lot about how our society is able to react uh, in a human way to a pandemic. What's fascinating for me is the infrastructure that we now have in place that in some ways feels like at least a semi-permanent legacy. Let's take, for example, the triumph of remote work, which I think is controversial in terms of the productivity, right. you hear a very different message from CEOs than you do from the workers of the Zoom class you mentioned. Um, you know, you're seeing a lot of big government, uh, I'd say, in terms of the role of government, the type of surveillance that we do for good and for ill. I mean, what do you think um, in some ways should be unwound given the research that you've done or at least reconsidered? I don't have any problem with, I mean, remote learning, I mean, remote learning, remote, uh, remote work to me is, is a deal, is something that has to be negotiated between a company and its workers. Mm -hmm. I totally get that Goldman Sachs wants its workers in-house. And I, 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 I 
you know, I like going. To, I, I like going to an office. I like talking to people. I think good ideas flow from that. But I also know a CEO who will remain nameless, unfortunately, because that's the way he wants it. Who loves uh, uh, the fact that his workers are, are working remotely, and he says, you know, I've saved seventy percent of my office space the cost, and um, we have little cluster offices where people can meet, and you know, we just think it's wonderful. So mm. to me, that's just that is an important change. I don't think we'll go all the way back, but um, uh, I'm okay with that. Surveillance, not so great, but we, you know, the thing that's missing, Diane, is is the kind of infrastructure that would allow you to immediately begin contact tracing. Mm -hmm. You don't have that. Which we comes down to trust, any, maybe, right? Yeah, is we that don't have any... Is that a matter of trust? No, no, it's not a matter of trust. That that's a matter of having a a a a, uh, a citywide societal infrastructure like they had. San Francisco did a really good job of this, but that's because mm. they've been through the AIDS crisis, so they had this infrastructure already. They're the only city in the country that really was prepared like this, and that, by the way, they're the only city, no city in in America did as well during COVID as San Francisco. Um, it's interesting, by the way, that that CEO you mentioned wants to remain nameless. That alone says something about the times that we're no, in. No, it's not, that's not the reason why. It's 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 um, it's a it's a. I better say this quietly. It's a Warren Buffett company. Oh, okay. Ergo, <laughs> ergo, you need permission. There, there is. A, you have to manage up you in such situations. Yeah, something to just don't um, want to talk about. Right. Is there is there anything else when you when you think about again the takeaway? You know, again, we want people to read the book, of course, The Big Fail. But as we're thinking about it now, you know, toward the end of, of 2023, um, what are some of the things that you think should be on the public agenda around this that maybe are not? Well, I mentioned I mentioned the need for trust. I mentioned the need for what I, what I call radical honesty. Um, I think that's one thing. But I also think that science needs to do the studies that can really tell us what works and what doesn't. And we need to have a consensus, a national consensus about how to approach a pandemic. Remember, so much of this planning began during the Bush administration and well before the pandemic, because he had read John Barry's book, The Great Influenza, and he said, mm -hmm. oh my God, this is gonna happen and we need to be prepared. And there was a huge fight over what the pandemic measures should be. Should there be a lockdown kind of thing or should we you know, protect the elderly or protect the immune compromised and let everybody else go about their own? And we never came to a consensus about that. And as the pandemic um, uh, grew, that division, which had been you know, unseen in 2007, suddenly became huge and political. And you know, after, after the financial crisis and after a lot of crises, um, the, co the country has had a national commission or some effort to come to terms with what happened and why and how to prevent it again. And you'll notice there hasn't been anything like that with the pandemic. Yep. yep. And it's a shame. It's a, it's a shame. And, and, and the main reason, I think, is because everybody knows that they'll never come to a consensus and they'll never come to an agreement about what worked and what didn't, and they're not willing to do the science. And so they're just leaving it, you know, like for the next time. And I think that's, I think that's tragic. Let me ask one other question in terms of whether it's spending or response, but I think spending is something that certainly is top of mind. How do we compare to other countries? Um, because that is one of the things that gets a lot of criticism now is who got support. You mentioned, for example, the airlines versus the restaurants, but also there was a lot of money pumped into the system to support, you know, the average American through this. Is that something that you think is being revisited or should be revisited as a policy? I think it should be revisited somewhat. I mean, Germany, I think Germany was giving every citizen I can't remember how much it was, but I mean, it was on the order of five or six thousand dollars a month. Wow! So, I mean, they're, they're, so they had they had one. Their policy was: we're going to take care of everybody. We're not going to worry about companies. We're just going to let people make sure people have enough money to live, and we're yeah. not going to worry about it. 
we had a different um, a different approach. You know, we were going to help small businesses. We were going to extend unemployment, and doing it the way we did it resulted in a tremendous amount of fraud. So even if you say, "I don't mind spending this kind of money," I don't mind uh, the the potential threat to inflation. Uh, even if you even if that's your stance, the, the fraud was was just obscene. It was just obscene. And so the question is, you know. You can't just say we're not going to give people anything if we're going to shut down businesses and so on. You, mm -hmm. you can't do that. You, 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 the economic um, uh, consequences would be severe. But on the other hand, I mean, we did pump out so much money. We practically guaranteed ourselves that 8% inflation that we had. And that was that was pretty damaging. Yep. Well, the book is The Big Fail by Joe Nacera and Bethany McLean, with whom you've collaborated on another book, I believe, 13 years ago. Um, so That's right. I'm the, power on the financial team. crisis. All, all the devils are here. All um, the devils are here. And, um, and it uh, goes on sale this week. And thanks very much for joining us, Joe. I'm thrilled that you uh, took the time to talk to me.